everybody, welcome back. Uh, I'm honored today to be joined by the author of the new book, There's Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. She testified in the, was it, the impeachment 1.0 uh, of, of Donald and uh, please welcome Fiona Hill. Hello. Hey, Alison, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm so glad to talk to you today. Um, and because I, your book is so riveting and and, you know, at first I was like, I'm not going to be able to relate to the, you know, somebody on the National Security Council, but I can relate to so much that's in this book. And I know a lot of people and I know a lot of women can also uh, relate to, to, to many uh, of the things that you talk about as we go through this book. And, and first, I, I wanted to ask you about the title and how it relates to the journey you took from being a coal miner's daughter uh, to being the senior director of European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council. It's quite a it's quite a journey. Can you talk about that and the title of the book? Yeah, well, the title of the book, There's Nothing For You Here, uh, came from something that my dad said to me one day when I was walking home with him um, from a job I had in a local pub. Um, my hometown was a former coal mining town with all kind of associated industries. It was a pretty rough place because all of the work had uh, disappeared. The mines had closed down, the big manufacturing plants had closed down, the factories were closing down, you name it. And you know, a lot of people were turning to drink. Um, and, you know, the local pubs were the one place that, the, um, you know, the economy was booming. And, uh, you know, in the UK, yeah, yeah, that's it. Drinking laws are very different from the United States. I've got a job in the local pub. My dad was at this point working in the hospital opposite um the particular pub that i was working in on on nights and at closing time if he was off work he would walk over to pick me up on foot <laughs> and we'd walk back home together and talk and in this period and i was applying for college um it was uh, a massive youth unemployment crisis in the united kingdom especially in the north of england 90 percent of kids who were leaving school in that year 1984 had nothing else to go on to when they left it didn't mean they wouldn't eventually find a job but they'd got nothing lined up you know, only 10% of kids had. And I had uh, been very lucky that I'd got a place at university. And only a five or 6% of kids in the whole of the UK at that point went on to a university, you know, kind of a, um, I, I, it was much higher, of course, in the United States in that same uh, time frame. But, you know, the uh, benefit uh, for me was that as a, as a poor kid, the kind of a former coal miner in a, you know, pretty down at heel, uh, town, you know, from a, a poor socioeconomic background, I was going to get that whole education paid for me by our local education authority, by the government, equivalent to the kinds of things that, you know, people, you know, have had from Pell Grants and other, you know, subsidies uh, from the state in the United States. And so there wasn't that barrier to go into university. I'd done well at school. I'd been able to apply and to go. But then the next thing was what after that? And my dad was basically saying as we were walking home, but, you know, there's nothing for here, pet. You know, when you, when you leave... You know, college, if you get your way through college, you know, you won't be able to come back here. You'll have to look for somewhere else to go and work and figure out what you want to do. It was essentially also telling me, I don't want you to come back here because, you know, there's nothing, you know, for you here where you could really kind of build a whole life and career for yourself. My dad had found a job in the local hospital after all the closures of mines and steelworks and brickyard, brickyard works where he'd um, also uh, worked for a particular point. But, you know, for him, that was it. He was kind of stuck. And, you know, it was, it was a it was a pretty grim message. And it, it also made me very sad because you know, I love my dad. I love my family. I actually like my home area. But every opportunity, educational job, life was just disappearing. What uh, prompted you to move to the United States? Well, that came through an educational opportunity. Um, I went off to a four year degree in St. Andrews University in Scotland. I won a scholarship to go and study in the Soviet Union in 1987, 1988. When I was there in the Soviet Union, it was the high point of the cemetery between Gorbachev and Reagan. And I actually got a job as a stringer for NBC News uh, during the Gorbachev-Reagan summit in Moscow in the um, early summer of 1988, you know, the end of the time that I was there. And of course, being a stringer, you know, um, until uh, a, a string of not very glamorous jobs, I spread Tom Brokaw's hair. You know, he was the, the, you know, the lead anchor there for the nightly news as he was standing on the top of this hotel overlooking the Kremlin and the wind was blowing his hair around. He'd go, where's the girl with the hairspray? And I'd run up and go, Psh! 
<laughs> you know, kind of, and hope it was going to hold in place. And then I got asked to make coffee for Maria Shriver. And I was like very excited because I mean, I, you know, I didn't really know exactly who Maria Shriver was, but I knew she was married to Arnold Schwarzenegger. I knew who he was. And I was like, oh, I've got to go make coffee. And, you know, my idea of coffee was opening a Nescafe packet, <laughs> pouring it in some water <laughs> and clicking it around with a spoon. I'm from the UK. We make tea. And coffee was disgusting. And he was an American uh, drip a coffee machine I was like what the hell is this I mean it looked like you know kind of a nuclear submarine to me I had no idea what to do with this there was these pieces of paper I read there were filters there was coffee granules there was you know I suppose of water somewhere I was making an absolute mess I was pouring the water in the wrong place I didn't know what to do with the filter there was coffee all over the place and a man came in turned out to be an American professor who was helping out with you know senior advising at the for the <laughs> programming so what are you doing I explained hey I'm sorry I'm British I don't know how to use this I've never seen one before so he showed me how to switch it on, put the water in, put the paper in, clean up the mess. And then he's saying, so what are you doing with yourself? I said, I was a student. I was figuring out what next to do. And, you know, I'd never been to the US before. This is very exciting, you know, working in this environment. He said, you know, there are scholarships in the United States. And I was like, really? You know, and I could apply for one. So Jimmy could. And so he tells me, you know, what I need to do. And so I did. You know, I thought, my goodness, what an amazing piece of information. Who knew? I mean, obviously he knew. <laughs> I didn't know. You know, so I uh, made a trip over, first of all, to the British Embassy, embassy talked to the cultural attaché. He tells me, you've got the American Embassy. I'll, I'll help you figure this out. And the next thing, I'm applying to all of these scholarships in the United States to see the other side of the Cold War. And I mean, what, what an amazing opportunity that opened itself up. Yeah, and, and, you know, I guess, you know, being in 87, in the Soviet Union, 87, 88, has had to have, you know, and also studied in Russia, had to really inform sort of things that you went on to do later. I mean, it's almost like you were clandestine, or not clandestine, you were destined, uh, other things are clandestine. But yes, exactly, particularly my, uh, <laughs> yeah, there, you see, you make a and sit there. <laughs> But it seems like, yeah, it seems like you were destined to sort of to take the route that, that you've taken. It's kind of amazing sort of what the universe sort of puts, lays out in front of you as a path. Um, and, and that sort of brings me to how you came to work for the Trump administration, because it was actually uh, KT McFarland. And I was surprised to read that here in the book. I didn't know this. It was KT McFarland, deputy number two to uh, <clears throat> Mike Flynn that first approached you about this and, and you know we we know we're familiar with katie mcfarlane with regards to bud mcfarlane and the middle east marshall plan with flynn and all those other uh stories that we've covered but also you know that she had sort of you know information relayed back and forth possibly to trump while she was in mar-a-lago and and i think where was where was flynn the dominican republic or something when he was making his phone calls but She's very, uh, a very big part of that. But can you tell us how how this came to pass? How it was you ran into KT McFarland, who 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 sought you out? Yeah, to well, look, like this? most people, people have all kinds of backstories, right? And she started off her life also wanting to kind of, you know, break into, um, you know, kind of a, a White House position, work for a president, you know, kind of with advising. But, but back in the day when she started off, the only job that a woman could get was as a secretary. So she actually starts off as a secretary and in the press pool, works her way up over various administrations, mostly, of course, Republican administrations, you know, and, and ends up, you know, working for Reagan, you know, et cetera. And then, um, of course, she has a, um, a program on Fox News. And she's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now I'm sure everyone's going, ah, oh, yes, hidden government there. But the Council of Foreign Relations is, you know, obviously um, a membership organization of professionals from all kinds of different backgrounds. And... Um, I had written a book in 2013 about Vladimir Putin. Uh, it was kind of the culmination of a lot of work I'd been doing following Putin, you know, since uh, 2000, talking about the clandestine element you were you know, referring to. It was one of these, again, weird coincidences that I start my job at the Brookings Institution as a pretty junior fellow, at the same time Vladimir Putin becomes the president of Russia. Bit of a weird coincidence, but actually, you know, it, it enables me to start following him, you know, right from uh, the very beginning. And, you know, I was looking, obviously, as most people are when, they, you know, they have a book and nobody knows them, but you've got this book that you think, you know, people you would enjoy reading or be interested in. I was looking for any outlets, you know, hopefully that, you know, somebody would be interested in uh, talking about my book. I gave a talk on a panel, a very small panel, almost nobody came to at the Council on Foreign Relations, but KT came. She was very interested and she invited me onto her program. And then I did um, a couple of uh, times onto her program, uh, DEFCON 3 on Fox uh, News, the streaming version. 
And then I did, uh, along with my colleague who I co-wrote the book with on Putin, Clifford Gaddy, an economist at uh, Brookings, we did a second edition after the um, Russians annexed Crimea and, mm. you know, basically started off the whole war in Ukraine. And Katie invited me back in again and to talk to her and we just you know started talking a lot and it was always very neutral nothing political nothing partisan she was very interested in Russia she um, knew a lot about Putin and you know kind of a lot of um, foreign affairs national security issues and then suddenly she's on the Trump campaign and not only KT but um, General Flynn had actually worked at the chairman's office and the joint chiefs of staff when I was the national intelligence officer for Russia back between 2006 and 2009. And then he'd gone to there to head the department, uh, the, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, so the Intel Department for the Defense um, uh, Sector. I had had no contact with him since then, but I'd worked really closely with him on Russia during that period I was there. And he'd been you know, perfectly sensible in that context. And so the two of them remembered me. I had no affiliation, you know, whatsoever with the campaign or with any of, uh, you know, the political aspects of this. And they needed someone, you know, to turn to, to ask about Russia. And it, it was me because I'd written a book. <laughs> you know, Katie actually had the book there. They wanted to talk about Putin and Russia. And the next thing I'm being asked, you know, will I kind of come in to talk to them? Uh, I never actually got to meet with Flynn because, you know, it actually also be re removed before I even, you know, got anywhere near the administration. But Katie thought that I could sit down, as I had with both Bush and then with Obama and, you know, on many other occasions that she'd seen me at and have just a kind of a straightforward, blunt talk about Putin to Trump. Well, that was kind of pie in the sky. Um, we all know that he doesn't really listen to anybody. I think, you know, Katie had kind of thought that he might. And that's how I ended up where I ended up. But the other thing was behind the scenes, there were lots of people that I'd worked with previously, detailed over from different parts of government, non-political, non-partisan, you know, partisan, professional career civil servants, many of whom I knew from all of my other jobs as national intelligence officer. And the whole idea was that we were going to try to do something to deal with this, you know, whole Russia mess behind the scenes. Of course, you know, the rest is history, as they say, and things didn't really kind of pan out quite as intended. <laughs> Yeah, not quite. To say the least, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and that's interesting too that you you know you talk about uh, General Flynn in, in the before times, uh, so to speak, and how there wasn't sort of any indication. And I mean, what a what a departure uh, it must seem like from working with him previously to working, you know. Uh, with him for a couple of months I guess or he you know he was no out. I never even I never oh, even saw him I saw, right. I'd yeah. actually never physically seen him this is the kind of weirdness <laughs> of right. everything since I'd left the National Intelligence Council mm -hmm. and a very brief encounter when he went over to the Defense Intelligence Agency and after that no contact and mm -hmm. in fact it took me a while to think is this the same guy you know mm -hmm. when I kind of saw him during the campaign and then and then now you know with um yeah it's I mean, just keep, you know, just continual sharp right turns to, to where I, I, I can't even articulate. Um, and, and this is kind of where I wanted to talk to you about the misogyny that was happening in, in the Trump administration, because you, there was sort of this, like you said, pie in the sky idea that you were going to have a serious sit down talk as a Putin expert, as a Russia expert with uh, Donald Trump. And that never panned out. In fact, kind of the opposite happened. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the interactions that uh, early on interactions that you had uh, with with the president in the Oval Office? Oh, well, right from the very beginning, it was a kind of a, who's this person? I mean, didn't even look up on the first uh, time that I encountered him. And, you know, the next time he thought I was the secretary and, you know, asked me basically to go and type up. Um, some changes he wanted to do to the press release during, you know, a meeting after a, a phone call, um, well, it was during a phone call with Putin, but immediately afterwards, instead of, as I thought, you know, we'd be discussing, you know, the import of the call. I was the only Russian speaker in the room. You know, I was there as the, you know, senior director for Russia, but no, um, you know, he had no idea who I was. And even if he had, I don't think he would have cared because it was another occasion when I did get introduced to him properly and he looked at me and uh, probably for the first and only time and KT said Mr President you know this is your new Russia advisor Fiona Hill she's written the book on Putin you know I think you really enjoy you know talking to her he looked at me looked at her and then there was a whole bunch of the cabinet um, members in the Oval Office seated around him and he said Rex does Russia 
which is an immediate, you know, kind of, but not you. And Rex, meaning Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State. I exchanged awkward looks with Rex Tillerson, who I'd actually uh, met before because, you know, as a Russian expert, I've actually met him, you know, when he was the CEO <laughs> of ExxonMobil. And I thought, well, that's that then. Um, you know, so uh, that plan was obviously going to go nowhere. So, you know, I resolved after that that I was going to focus on my interactions with everybody else and trying to just get across as much as I possibly could about the perils and risks and, you know, potentially, possibly, perhaps, and opportunities for working with Putin and the Russians. Because the whole main point then was to try to figure out how we basically got them out of our politics. All of these intrusions, the hacking, you know, in cyberspace, we'd have to work across the entire government to do this. How we would keep them out of our electoral systems in the future, I'd have to work with, you know, colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security. You know, people like Chris Krebs, who, you know, people may have heard and seen out on the television. I mean, these were all my counterparts across different parts of government. And as a result, I was just going to work with them as much as I, can, I could and, you know, kind of give up on the idea that I was ever going to influence anything that, you know, uh, Donald Trump uh, would, would think about Putin or anything else in my portfolio. I also had Ukraine, Turkey, the whole of Europe, the European Union and NATO in my uh, portfolio. So, you know, I saw him on numerous occasions all the time in all these different settings and each time it was almost as if I was um I was invisible actually it wasn't as if I was invisible I was invisible and you you also talk in the book a little bit about a nickname that you had found out I think you were talking to a reporter um and learned that I, maybe Reince Priebus and some others had had a nickname yeah. for you yeah, it was kind of amazing because, I mean, I, I figured out that none of them had paid any attention to me at the, you know, the White House inner circle. And, you know, the party was doing a feature, you know, for me, um, about me in an interview said, you know, did you know, by the way, that they had a nickname before? I was like, no, did they? <laughs> wow. No, what was it? And he said, oh, Russia bitch. I was like, oh, yeah, figures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. Um, you know, disparaging, but, you know, also strangely complimentary at the same time. You know, so I got, I thought to myself, wow, well, actually, maybe they have noticed me. Mm. Uh, yeah. But, you know, but, but, you know, to what effect was a, you know, was a different matter because the, this was, you know, obviously also meant to disparage and push away, nothing to hear here or nothing to look at here. They didn't want to know actually, you know, what substantive issues I could bring to the table. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I imagine they thought you didn't have any substantive. Uh, th- yeah, I mean, I was a sort of a table. nondescript middle-aged woman, <clears throat> you know, I described this in the book, you know, I mean, you know, well into my 50s, you know, it's kind of... Um, you know, you're just not a non-player. And that was really, you know, described and laid out to me. But that was not the case for, you know, the professional staff or the other cabinet members. I did not get that at all from the cabinet secretaries who I interacted with or the national security advisors that I work with, which is H.R. McMaster and then John Bolton. On the contrary, they, you know, had the, um, the greatest respect for me as I did for them. And, you know, we had lots of substantive discussions. So it wasn't all lost. It was just at the very top, you know, the president played true to type, you know, as you know, we'd all have uh, suspected that he's uh, the misogyny that we saw in the campaign trail, you know, was brought into the Oval Office with only a few exceptions. And even then, you know, for people he clearly uh, respected, like Kellyanne Conway, every, all, the whole language and the ways that he interacted with them was, you know, very sexist. Yeah. And I, I, you mentioned Bolton, and I want to talk a little bit uh, uh, about Bolton and the shadow Ukraine policy. Uh, and some of the other things that you had mentioned about, particularly about that call the, where you were the only Russia speaker and how it, how it ended up being characterized by, by the group of the people, by, by a bunch of people who didn't speak Russian. Uh, but I have to take a quick break. Will you stay with me? Of course. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. We'll be right back. Everybody, welcome back. We're talking to the author of There's Nothing For You Here, Fiona Hill. Um, if Fiona, before the break, you had mentioned uh, you didn't get that sort of uh, a vibe from uh, cabinet members and, and folks like John Bolton. And I wanted to ask you about John Bolton and specifically about something that hit the news really hard. And that was the meeting, uh, especially after you testified about this in the impeachment trial, the meeting where John Bolton uh, had, had mentioned something about uh, what Rudy Giuliani was doing. Uh, in Ukraine and referred to it as a drug deal and then walked out of that meeting. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that meeting? Can you like uh, recreate it for us? Because it's an absolutely fascinating piece of testimony and incredible in the book. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the sort of fitful meeting when it becomes apparent to me and to everyone else that um, 
there is no longer really the main thrust of national security policy towards Ukraine, but Ukraine has, is on the verge of becoming privatized and certainly part of the sort of domestic uh, political uh, scene. And also that President uh, Trump, or at least people around President Trump at this particular juncture, it wasn't clear it was Trump himself always directing it and orchestrating it, but that people were seeing Ukraine as part of the campaign to get Trump re-elected. And it was already you know, underway, even though we were still some way out there from uh, the actual election. So what happens here is that um, one of the advisors, the key advisors to the new president of Ukraine, President Zelensky, and some others have come they're hoping to get a White House meeting with President Trump because, you know, Ukraine is always trying to show that it has the support of the United States in its struggle with Russia. And uh, Ambassador Bolton and others, you know, myself included, are quite reluctant to set up this meeting at this particular juncture because it's not quite clear where this is all going to go. And there isn't, you know, kind of really a you know, particular frame for a meeting at this, uh, at this point. And also, we're starting to get a little bit worried about, you know, what might actually happen in this meeting. Uh, worries that weren't misplaced by the time we get the phone call, you know, down the line between Trump and uh, Zelensky. And so, um, uh, basically, uh, they're coming into the meeting. Um, President um, uh, Zelensky's envoys are talking about trying to get a meeting. We have Ambassador Sondland, the ambassador of the EU, not to Ukraine, who's there, because our U ambassador of the uh, Ukraine... Maria Yovanovitch, Master Yovanovitch, has been sacked at this point as part of some of these machinations around Ukraine that she was getting in the way of. And, um, you know, they're basically pushing uh, to try to get uh, this meeting. Ambassador Bolton saying, well, you know, not quite there yet. And then suddenly Ambassador Sunderland, the ambassador of the EU, interjects and says, well, you know, kind of we've already got an agreement, um, you know, to um, uh, have a meeting you know, if there are, uh, you know, some movement on uh, these energy issues. And Ambassador Bolton clearly knows there's something afoot here. He stiffens, he sits up, we're all like, whoa, hang on, what's going on? And he ends the meeting. And then the next thing is that the Ukrainians on Ambassador Sondland and there's some other people there with them decamp down to a room right by the White House Situation Room, the, the ward room. It's actually all right also next to the Navy mess in this very tight little um set of corridors in the west wing of the White House. And this is also extraordinarily unusual. And um, Ambassador Bolton sends me after them to see what's up, uh, what's going on there, and asks me to come back and report. And of course, I get down there, and it becomes clear Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who is our director from Ukraine, is in the midst of you know, what's turning out to be a bit of an argument with um, Ambassador Sondland, who's kind of taken Ukraine as part of his portfolio, to the effect that um, Sondland is basically saying that he's got an agreement from Mick Mulvaney and others that if um, the Ukrainians agree to open some investigations, and this is into Burisma, the energy firm that um, uh, former Vice President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, has been on the board of, you know, then they can have their Oval Office meeting. And we're like, whoa, OK, hang on, yeah. you know, what's going on here? So I, you know, kind of then have to run back up to tell Ambassador Bolton about this as everyone's left. And Ambassador Bolton then, you know, famously says, you go and tell the lawyers over in the National Security Council that I am not part of whatever drug deal Mulvaney and you know, Giuliani and Sondland and others are all basically cooking up here. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I duly go off and kind of report all that. And that's, you know, the moment when we realize that there's the, an effort to privatize you know, foreign policy and national security policy, you know, there's, there's things going on here that have nothing to do, you know, with the stuff that we were working on in terms of trying to sort of stabilize the Ukrainian US relations There's something else going on entirely. And after Masha Ivanovich had been uh, put in the crosshairs, and it was obvious that she was going to get removed and did get removed, I'd gone to uh, Ambassador Bolton and said, look, is there something we can do here? This is preposterous. This is one of our finest diplomats. Um, should we've got to be able to push back here and you know obviously it was Rudy Giuliani was in the mix here and Ambassador Bolton said to me very famously again you know I mentioned this also in the testimony that Rudy Giuliani was a hand grenade that was going to blow everyone up and of course you know we get fast forward to the impeachment trial um, President Trump has had this phone call that we'd all been trying to avoid with President Zelensky of Ukraine that you know, was supposed to substitute for a meeting, you know, the Oval Office or some presidential meeting. And he's openly asking President Zelensky of Ukraine to open up investigations mm -hmm. into Biden and uh, his son. Yeah, do me a favor. And, you know, which was, a, yeah, do me a favor. I mean, the famous line. And it, that was completely shocking because 
I had not witnessed him do anything so blatant in any call or any setting before. It was always much more subtle, talking around things, making a joke, you know, that you might be in two minds as to what he really meant, although you were pretty sure he meant the, you know, the not so great uh, interpretation of, you know, what he had just said. But this is the first time that I had certainly heard him be so brazen. I was just as shocked as everyone else. And that was when it all came crystal clear to me that the president was orchestrating this, not Giuliani and, um, or not just, let's say, Giuliani and some business associates who clearly wanted to, you know, do business and you know, had all kinds of other interests in Ukraine, that this was about the U.S. presidential elections. Yeah. And, and as we know, uh, Trump famously said about the call, it was a perfect call. It was tremendous. And, and you, you address that kind of behavior in the book too, sort of this, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you say that it, the, the chapter 13, the horrible year, which is in reference to 2020. Um, and some days I still feel stuck in March of that year, I have to say, but yeah, I think, well, we all are still in many respects, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. And, you and say, it was March 13th, you know, also yeah. 2020, a Friday the 13th, that we all went into <clears throat> mostly into massive lockdown. It wasn't a great day. No, it wasn't. And then we felt like we were there forever. And uh, you say in the book, you say, quote, I was immediately struck by how much the US, UK and Russia, the three countries that had defined my personal and professional life now resembled each other in their failure to mount a serious, well-coordinated response to the pandemic. And that response was kind of a window into other similarities, uh, you know, as you, you drew a line through Reaganism, Thatcherism, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the impact that those things have on current events. And I wanna talk about the parallels between those three countries and how you know, we're in danger of kind of sliding towards modern Russia. Uh, but this particular way that he, the way that Trump sort of just, everything's great, everything's good, I'm, I win, I win all the time. And that's what sort of separated him from Thatcher and Reagan, right? Because you, you, you drew parallels, but also there was a difference and it was kind of his self-obsessiveness. And you tell a story earlier in the book about that call that you mentioned um, before the break uh, where you were the only Russia speaker in the room. It came after mm -hmm. the missile strike on Syria. And you actually had a different impression from what was said on the phone right. after, after they hung up. After, after they hung up, everyone was like, great call, awesome job, high five. And uh, all right, let's go to lunch. Uh, can you talk about that just a little, a, a little bit? Because I'm interested to know how you would characterize that particular phone call. Well, I mean, the, the, so the phone call was the first since the missile strike uh, between um, uh, Trump and Putin. Uh, everything has to be interpreted, right? I mean, we have a State Department interpreter that interprets the president for the Russians and the Russians have their own interpreter. So, um, you know, it's not always easy for everyone to hear, you know, the, the speaker behind the interpreter. They listen to the interpreter's voice. Uh, and, you know, many interpreters have mellifluous tones. In some respects, I mean, our interpreters for the president are women, you know, who soften off, you know, all the rough edges. And, you know, sometimes that's the, the same for the counterpart, you know, the different tone of voice, you know, different way in which they're expressing things. And Russian is a very rich language. There's a lot of nuance in it that, you know, sometimes, you know, it takes a whole paragraph to explain in, um, in English. And it's got a couple of words, you know, in Russian, they go, oh, hang on, that was an interesting word choice. That's conveying, you know, X or Y. And I've been listening really intently to what um, Putin was saying behind the translator, because the translator doesn't always catch it. And I was trained as an interpreter actually in Moscow. I spent that year when I was in Moscow, 87, 88, I was at a translator's institute. It's what I thought I might do. I thought that I might become a professional translator, maybe the United Nations or something like this. You know, I didn't anticipate that I would be in this position. I'd spent a lot of time studying Russian and, you know, working on my translation skills. I've actually, you know, earned money at different times doing translations. And so I was listening to this very intently and I thought, wow, you know, okay, there's a bit more menace here. You know, he's laying things out in a, you know, a, a much harsher tone, but they're missing it completely because they're just getting the interpreter you know, who's kind of smoothing things off, not always translating the word in, you know, quite the same way because the translators are pressed to, you know, get this out in real time. And, you know, everybody else in the room and uh, Jared Kushner and Vanka Trump were there too, which had thrown me off for a bit, along with, you know, the senior directors for uh, the Middle East who were covering Syria, Rex Tillerson, his um, special assistant. You know, they were basically saying, what a great call. You know, that was like a great atmosphere. He sounded really friendly. I was like, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and the translator sounded really friendly, but, you know, Vladimir Putin didn't actually, you know, he, he wasn't openly hostile, but there was, you know, things that he was saying there that we should have been paying attention to. And I was about to sort of interject and say something when then that's when 
you know, I actually also had a headache and wasn't paying proper attention. I was in my notes trying to formulate, as you always do, what were you going to say to kind of convey, you know, probably in the few minutes you might have, you know, what had actually happened. And next thing, the president saying, hey, darling, are you listening to me? I was like, what, 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 me? She, and they said, can she do it? And I think she, she do what? And I realized she wasn't Ivanka Trump and she wasn't Secretary Tillerson's uh, special assistant. She was me. And he thought that I was the, um, the secretary because I was sitting next to the uh, guy who was manning the phone and I was taking notes. And he thought that I could go and sort of retype out the press release for the great call that he just had. Hmm. It was not my best professional moment. I had the deer in the headlights look. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I was confused. I was like, is he really talking to me? I guess he is. What do I do now? And nobody mm. threw me a lifeline. Nobody said, oh, actually, you know, Mr. President, this is Bjorn Hill. She's the Russia, you know, senior director. But from Trump's <coughs> point of view, just to kind of point this out and lay it out, he thought everybody was a secretary. And look, if you're called Secretary of State, Secretary mm. of Defense, you know, Homeland Security, Secretary, you know, these things, he's not far off in his mind. Everything was mm. a secretariat. We were there just to push paper around or do the things that he asked, like the admin offices and the back offices in his businesses. So right. even um, Rex Tillerson, having been CEO of ExxonMobil or General uh, McMaster, you know, basically a, a, an American war hero, a, a senior figure in uh, the, um, the US armed forces, for them, for him, once they became part of his staff, they were really, you know, nothing uh, to, you know, be particularly concerned about for him information trickled down not up and you know once he became his staff he was staff hmm. yeah and it, it seems like it seems like donald trump had a lot of translators literally and figuratively speaking uh, who would just feed him the best you know everything's great you're amazing um and yeah i and mean the people who said something to the country um didn't survive very long <clears throat> or you know they're like you know general kelly who uh, replaced uh, Rince Priebus as the chief of staff. I mean, he was, you know, trying to be pretty tough and, you know, kind of bring order together and it became too much for him. You know, General Mattis, who famously never, you know, kind of uh, devolved himself in, or debased himself into, you know, these obsequious um, displays of adulation and, you know, affirmation of Trump. You know, Ambassador Bolton, I mean, never did that either. Uh, General McMaster certainly didn't. At one point, he walked out because Trump was being so rude. He just literally walked out of the Oval Office. We all had to kind of, you know, run around, you know, after him. All the people who tried to stand up and to push back and to say things as they were, um, you know, were, were kind of pushed out, marginalised, or in, you know, my in other case, never even given a chance to really say anything. You know, we could express our views, you know, very strongly to everyone else, but you know, Trump didn't want to hear them. Yeah, and um, you mentioned. Um the ouster of Yovanovitch. And uh, right now, uh, as we speak, there are investigations going on, um, criminal federal investigations in Southern District of New York, Eastern District of New York, surrounding her ouster, the smear campaign, among other things um, with the, you know, had to do with particularly Rudy Giuliani in, in Ukraine. And uh, do you know anything about those investigations that we might, that the public might not have heard yet? Have you been asked to participate in any of these investigations or asked to testify? No, I have not. And I mean, you know, I obviously myself, you know, watching things unfolding with Rudy Giuliani and the two Ukrainian American businessmen, uh, Lev Parnas and um, Igor Fruman, I was also myself trying to figure out who are they, what are they doing, what do they want. I mean, I assumed, and actually, just as in fact, just seemed to be the case that they were pursuing their own business interests. Uh, along with uh, Rudy Giuliani, that they had contracts for some businesses, they had investments that they wanted to push through. And our ambassador and people around her in the embassy were getting in their way in some regards, because the um, ambassador and the embassy in Kiev uh, were trying to promote uh, good governance programs, anti-corruption programs, transparency. And, you know, they were getting in the crosshairs of corrupt business interests in Ukraine that these are the, you know, guys were trying to connect with so she was clearly in the way mm -hmm. and they orchestrated her maneuver uh, her, her removal in a maneuver <laughs> uh, you know basically um uh there is a video on youtube that lev parnas handed over I and mean, he's just you know today being or in the last few days rather being in the press you know about the the case that you're referring to and uh, illegal campaign contributions investigations into you know how she ended up being ousted from her position and they put up a, um, a, a video, they'd recorded it themselves, of meeting with Trump in the Trump Hotel in uh, Trump International in Washington, D.C., at a dinner that was set up for donors like themselves. 
And they basically record themselves telling Trump that the ambassador in Ukraine is bad news. Hold over, you know, from previous administrations going around apparently telling everyone she's going to be impeached, refusing to put up his picture in the embassy. He doesn't ask if this is true. He just assumes it is because these are people from his peer circles. And he immediately mm. says, take her out, get rid of her. Yeah. And then later we hear him in the um, transcript of the phone call telling uh, President Zelensky, a foreign leader of a foreign country, that she's going to go through some things. I mean, that is completely unprecedented for an American president. He's supposed to be defending Americans from foreign powers, irrespective of whether they're friendly or not standing up for them. I mean, he is our representative abroad. I mean, imagine how chilling to have your own president say something so harsh and threatening about you to a foreign leader. She's going to go through some things. It's frightening. Yeah, um, that that really stuck, stuck out to me as well. And um, I, I consider Yovanovitch to be a, a a hero, uh, a patriot. She's the best of the best. I mean, yeah. she is one. She was one of our most um, re- well-respected ambassadors. You know, woman. I mean, one of the top women in the the foreign service. You know, someone who really had a stellar career. She's actually writing a memoir that's going to come out. Um, I think early next year about you know, her experiences. Are just an incredibly storied career, and she's an immigrant. You know, like myself, like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, and you know many others who serve in the government. Immigrants who wanted to serve their country. We were interested in public service not in this self-service that we kind of saw um, around um, around us. And there were so many other incidents, I've described these in the book. I mean, a lot of persecution of women diplomats uh, from the Foreign Service. You know, countries who decided that they didn't want the person who was going to be appointed, often a woman, you know, to be ambassador or, you know, senior official by the United States and the government that would, uh, you know, take on lobbyists to get rid of them. And it worked because here are two guys um, and Rudy Giuliani who got rid of uh, one of our best uh, foreign service officers, mm-hmm. you know, for their own purposes. Right. Yeah. And that, and that second part of it is, is kind of where it hits home. Um, particularly when you're talking about these criminal investigations, hopefully we'll see something and some movement on that. But, um, finally, before, before uh, we get out of here, I, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about, um, first of all, your recollection of January 6th is amazing. I, I really highly recommend if you haven't already, um, that everybody pick this book up and, and read it. Um, but back to that sort of discussion that, that's sort of gone throughout the book, US, UK, uh, US, UK, Russia, and this, this coup, this attempt to overthrow the government, which is, which is linked to the, you know, the election interference and the Ukraine call. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's all just sort of one giant conspiracy, one giant scheme to hold on to power, what you call a self coup. Uh, talk a little bit about because we're still in it, right? Uh, as as you had mentioned earlier, we're it's still happening. Uh, how do yep. we how do we survive this part of our history? Well, we have to stand up and um, tell the truth and stand up for the truth. You know, George Orwell said in a time of universal deceit, you know, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And it's bizarre that you know telling the truth should be a revolutionary act. I mean, George Orwell, famous for 1984, you know, for the perversion of a democracy. Who would have thought that that would be the United States? That was not what he had in mind. I mean, he was worried about Britain, actually, in that kind of, you know, post-world period and, you know, some of the trends that he saw there. And also, you know, very cognizant of what was going on in the Soviet Union, the very early origins of uh, the Cold War. But, he, you know, he, he worried about totalitarianism and about authoritarianism coming from the left and the right. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, what we're seeing right now. I mean, we have uh, members of Congress who have taken an oath um, to the Constitution to serve their constituents, to serve the country, uh, basically more focused on the power that they can derive from one man and, you know, failing to stand up for democracy in the country. I mean, you know, even people are even saying that democracy is associated with one party, the Democratic Party, and democracy has become a kind of a negative word. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are talking down democracy. Uh, they're, they're refusing to um, hear any criticism of President Trump and everyone's getting labelled, anybody who criticises him. He himself labels people. I had a bizarre you know, statement issued by the president about me as well. He called me a deep state stiff with a nice accent, which is you know, slightly random. But anyway, oh, that, we was, got the uh, nice that was a nice accent bizarre. compliment. The nice though, accent bit, yes. Yeah. But the whole point of this is that you know everyone is defamed and denounced if they come out with anything critical. There are 330 million of us here in the United States. The preamble of the Constitution is we the people of the United States. The United States was founded to get rid of tyranny, to shake off you know, the monarchy from uh, Great Britain. 
I mean, we're what we're going to go back to creating a monarchical dynasty and you know, kind of back toward tyranny by slavish um, focus on one person. And you know, the fact the fact that this is kind of perverted, you know, one of the great parties, the party of Abraham Lincoln. You know, so I mean, what we need to get out of this, um, the, the way out of this, is for members of Congress, um, you know, other political leaders in states, um, you know, around the country to you know, basically shake themselves out of this thrall that, that, that they're in, as well as, you know, others from the media, you know, like yourself and others who uh, are engaged in a national discussion to try to stand up for the truth. This is not partisan. This is not about, you know, one particular perspective, left or right. This is about America and the future of a country that, you know, we all live in, that we all love. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me as an immigrant and, you know, like many of my other colleagues were immigrants, we're astounded that this is happening in the United States. This is what we thought happened in other countries. So if people think, oh, it can't happen here, you know, I don't see it. Well, you know, then we're all frogs boiling in that water. Yeah, I was going to say it's the the story. That's what's happening it, here. Right? Yeah. When you've come in from the outside, you know, maybe you've jumped in the water and it's pretty hot. You're like, well, hang on, hang on to the frogs. You know, there's something really happening here. The, the temperature's up. And, you know, we're trying to get across here, myself and many other people are speaking out, look, we're in real peril. This isn't over... This is maybe just a preface to the next steps here. And the only people who can change it is us. Getting out there, you know, keeping, uh, fighting for voting rights, you know, keeping, you know, our electoral systems, you know, speaking up in the name of democracy and speaking up on behalf of the United States. Yeah, and, and we will continue to do that. I'm glad you're on the team that's continuing to do that. And I'm really, really glad that, um, that you wrote this book. Uh, it was wonderful to read. I recommend everybody pick it up. It's called, There's Nothing For You Here. And I really appreciate your time today. Honestly, I'm truly honored to talk to you. Uh, and I thank you for your service. Likewise, Alison, really great to be with you. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Thanks. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs>